Welcome to the channel. This is Reliable Rudy. In this video, we're going to touch base on uh, a couple of the financials. I want to tweak some of the stuff that I had said in the previous video and just kind of get a further point across on that. We're also going to go into the difference between profit margins, free cash flow margins, and for BTI in particular in the next video, for the valuation, I'm going to be using different profit margins and free cash flow margin. I'll go over that later on in this video. We're going to touch base on BTI's uh, 2022 guidance and also some of the analyst projections for the company. Since I was not able to find any financial data for 2022, we're going to kind of get a, a feel for what we could potentially expect moving forward before we put in any numbers for our uh, stock analyzer tool. I also um, wanted to state that VT does not have a holding, Van the institution Vanguard Group does not have a holding in BTI, therefore I do not hold this in my VT or VXUS index. So that uh, puts me to my further point, I'm not a financial advisor, everything in this video contains only my opinion and is for entertainment purposes only. I have no individual holding in the company or in my index funds. Just simply stating my opinion, nothing more, nothing less. I'm not trying to persuade you guys in either direction, just stating my opinion. Okay, so getting into this video, what are we going to focus on? I want to touch base on the return on invested capital, the shares, the debt, and also the five-year average profit margins. The disconnect right here, we're going to touch base on that one last time just to get my point further across. So starting with the five-year return on invested capital, we're going to go to ROIC.AI, right here I have BTI pulled up. Here is their ROIC. Dating back from 2006, we're going to move right along in line. From 2006, we put up 17, 17, 15, 16, 17, 18, 23, 24, 21, 21, 18, 31. 31% 31 in the acquisition year of 2017. Now, they showed me from 2006 moving forward that they're more than capable of, of posting a return on invested capital that is quite attractive. This is very impressive track rate our track record right here. And yeah, am moving forward do I expect them to be around this low 6% return on invested capital? I'll leave that up to you guys to decide, but if we look post acquisition on a return on invested capital 5.6%, 5.8 6.4 and 6.6 .6. so consistently getting a larger return on invested capital moving forward for a 10-year analysis if we go to the stock analyzer tool this is a 10-year analysis do i think they're going to uh, be around this six percent return on invested capital or are they going to increase that consistently going forward from 2006 to 2016 they consistently increase their their return on invested capital and at a solid rate so touching base to the eight pillars at first glance, it doesn't look that great. But in the past, they've shown me that they can get a solid return on invest capital. I do like that. Do I look at this as a red check mark or a green check mark? I'll leave that up to you guys to decide. Next, we're going to go over the profit margin. Net profit margin from 2006, 19, 21, 20, 19, 19, 20, 25, 25, 23. Headset went out right there. 32, 31. Now in 2017, acquisition year, 185%. Now this is the five year average profit margin. One, two, three, four, five. The last five years, 2017 is included in that 185%. Now looking at this, am I going to be using 51%? No, no. My job is to to look at the information, determine where do I think their profit margins are going to be moving forward. Now, following that 185%, we put up 25, 22, 24.8, and 26.5. But let's not forget, 2021 is a strange year. All-time low interest rates in the United States. Stimulus checks, a lot of people had money to spend. You got to keep that in mind. But nonetheless, they are increasing their profit margins year to date over the last three years. I do like that. Moving forward, do I think this is going to be up or down? Post acquisition, this is the profit margins they put up. I do like the look of that. Now, the next thing I want to point out is the disconnect between profit margin and free cash flow margin. So from up here, we are now reading right to left from 2013 to 2021. Free cash flow margin. 14, 16, 39, 30, 26. Now that 26 
percent free cash flow margin is 2017. So moving forward, 45, 39, 42, 35. Does it make sense to use different profit margins and different free cash flow margin? Yes. Now, price to earnings is based off a of profit margin. Price to free cash flow is based off a of free cash flow margin. I'm going to be using lower price to free cash flow numbers than I am price to earnings numbers. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, leave something in the comments and I can uh, uh, reach out to you about that. So very interesting stuff right there. It's a little bit different from my uh, recent valuations in other companies. Next thing I want to talk about, these shares outstanding, because in their forward guidance, they talk about the shares outstanding. So going back to return on invest capital, common shares outstanding from 2006 to 2017. Consistently buying back shares, I'm not going to state them all out, consistently buying back shares, 2017 acquisition year, they issued shares and issued another set of shares the following year. Now, they've consistently been around this $2.28 billion. Are they going to be buying back shares or issuing shares going forward over my next 10 years? That is my analysis time frame. From 2006 to 2016, consistently buying back shares. Keep that in mind. Last thing I want to go over in the financial statements is the capital expenditures, net change in capital expenditures. From 2012 moving forward, they've consistently lowered their capital expenditures. 2017, the acquisition year, they increased their capital expenditures. Now they are back on track, decreasing their capital expenditures. They are opening up more cash by not increasing their capital expenditures so that they are able to pay off some of their longer term debt. And we'll just reiterate in the long-term debt right here. Here's the 2017 year. Big spike. Consistently been buying or paying off debt. If we go back to the cash flow statement down here, you can see here's the debt payments that they've made since 2017. Now, they are also issuing debt. I did not state that in my last video. They're still issuing debt but paying off debt. Same with they are repurchasing capital stock, but they are also issuing capital stock at the same time. You can see in 2017, we already know they issued shares, but they are also buying back shares at the same time. This is where you find, this is a part of their return on invested capital. So keep that in mind moving forward. Now, getting into some of these other articles, we're going to focus on the British American Tobacco Backs 2022 Guidance Update. Now, they announced this on June 9th of 2022. Now, I'm sure this is, guy is part of the board of directors, I'm sure. Something to do with the company. But it was posted by James. Uh, Maybe he's just uh, stating the article. It has nothing to do with the company. I don't know. But nonetheless, they backed their 2022 guidance. Now, what is their guidance? Uh, British Tobacco Thursday reiterates 2022 guidance, revenue, and earnings growth. Revenue growth maintain full year constant currency guidance of revenue growth at 2 to 4% for 2022. Keep that in mind. Mid to single digit adjusted earnings per share growth. And they reiterate in the tailwinds of 2021, 2%. Tough comparable sales from 2021. I'll show you that later on in this article. But that's for the first half and full year at 5% growth. Keep that in mind. Next, Chief Executive Jack Bowles says the company is highly cash generative and is on track to return 2 billion pounds or 2.51 billion USD to shareholders through its 2022 share buyback program. Going back to the shares, 2.2 billion. Now, if they are buying all those back through 2022, are they also going to be issuing shares? So it's going to be interesting when they release their 22 inform financial information, how many shares they buy back, subtract in the amount that they're also going to issue at the same time. Because they've showed us that they're going to buy back shares, but also issue shares. So keep that in mind. Not all of that share buyback is going to be direct correlation to the shares outstanding. There's going to be issuances along with that as well. Okay, got that point across. Next, however, first half group. So with BTI, they report their inf their financial data in terms of groups. First half is representing the first half of the year. Second half is representing the second half of the year. Makes sense, right? First half group results will reflect a strong prior year comparator in the United States. Hmm, why is it that they say the United States? 
all-time low interest rates. People had money to spend with stimulus checks in 2021 in the United States. Hmm. How interesting. Does it make sense that they're going to have strong prior year comparator comparable sales? Yes, it does. But they are still back in their 2 to 4% growth. Now, moving from 2022 to 2023, what are those numbers going to look like? Keep that in mind when we're doing our analysis. It is important to understand these things. So that is everything I wanted to state right there. Now we're going to go to analyst estimates for the company. Now, here, I'm not going to go through everything right here, but nonetheless, here is their income statement evaluation on annual data. Now, these are the analyst projections moving forward. Now, we know the company has stated that their revenue growth moving forward is going to be 2 to 4% for the year of 2022. They came out and reiterated that statement. They didn't decrease. They didn't increase. 2 to 4%. Now, I already know the calculation, but I'll pull it up anyways. This is the growth 2021 to 2022. They're estimating 8.2% growth, but the company is saying 2 to 4%. Watch out. Analysts are not going to be perfect. They are more than likely going to be on the higher side, lower side. I don't know. It all it all depends. But are, am I going to take what the analysts are saying or what the company is saying in more regard? Keep that in mind. Now, the following year, 2022 to 2023, here is the second projection right there. They're expecting 4.8% growth. Now, the next year from 2023 to 2024... They're expecting 4.3% growth. Okay, now they're stating that they're going to have revenue growth in 2022 of 2 to 4%. That's what the company said, 2 to 4% right there. But 2021, tough comparable sales in the United States. Analysts are expecting higher growth in 2022 and less growth in 2023. But nonetheless, we're going to move on. You can also see in the box, so the box is popping up right here. So when I hover over this, you can see net income or net margins. 25% is what they're expected for 2022. 2023, they're expected 28%. In 2024, they're expected 29%. Incre they're projected by analysts increasing net margins. Now, if we go back to return on invest capital, we can see that their net margins over the last three years have increased. Well, 2021 in the United States, tough comparable sales. They are anticipating some pullback. How much pullback are we going to get? That is for that is for us to decide moving forward. But 2023 and moving forward, they're expected 28 and 29 percent. So we are still getting that growth. Look at this pullback from 2018 to 2019, minus 2 percent. Back on track, back on track. Okay, 2022 would be reasonable to assume a little bit of a decrease, but are they going to get back on track following that and moving forward? I'll leave that up to you guys to decide. So next, I want to go over the net income. Net income. In 2022, they're expected $6.9 billion. The next year, $8.2 billion. The next year, $8.7 billion. They're expected net income growth. I do like that. What else do we want to go over right here real quick? That's the quarterly. Now the balance sheet. This is basically showing the debt. EBITDA is a um, is the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. You can use EV, which is enterprise value, divided by EBITDA to determine the debt levels of the company. They are expecting their debt levels to continue decreasing. So if we go back to return on invest capital, we look at the long-term debt. They are paying off debt, but they are issuing debt at the same time. Well, let's remember, in 2022, we've had quite a few rate hikes. Now, I don't know how that compares over in, Brit in Britain, but if they are also increasing their rates, then they are they in a comfortable position in terms of their debt? They are increasing their net income, increasing cash flow, increasing profitability. Are they going to be in a comfortable position in terms of debt? Are they going to be continuing paying off debt? Now, taking into consideration, they are upping their share buybacks. They have 2.x amount billion, 2.5 billion in share repurchases for 2022. Now, 
and from 2018 to 2021, they weren't buying back shares. But now, as they're paying off more and more debt, they're in a more comfortable position to be able to buy back shares. So keep that in mind. The last thing on this, I thought they had something about the dividends. Dividends per share, uh, I thought they did. But nonetheless, I thought we had some really good information moving forward. Um, yeah, we're going to see what type of numbers that we're going to project for the stock analyzer tool moving forward. We are at 15 minutes, a little bit longer than I wanted to be, but I felt we got some really good information off in this video. And yeah, um, if you guys like the video, make sure you drop a like, uh, subscribe to the channel, and we will see you on the next video for the stock analyzer tool.